the more voluntary unhappiness and pain you embrace, the less the involuntary stuff hurts. Is our focus on happiness making us unhappy? Erin, would you start us off? Hmm. Yeah. My worry with this panel is we might agree on too much. Uh, so m maybe I'll try and create some dissensus. For me, the issue isn't that we are pursuing happiness, but rather that we constantly seek to evade unhappiness. Um, I think there is basically a sort of pyramid upon which you would want to build happiness, contentment. The first is meeting one's personal needs, shelter, food, um, access to health care. On top of that, you would want to uh, see uh, certain projects in your life being fulfilled, self-actualization and whatnot. And furthermore, on top of that, you'd want a sense of obligation and service to other people. Now, I think unhappiness comes in when any of those three things are missing. So this idea, and it can be quite a reactionary one, I think, of, well, we just need a little bit more pain and misery in life, and actually that will do us all the world of good. I think that's mistaken. Whereas my mother's generation used to say, as I was growing up in the 1990s, what we need is a good war. A uh, very reactionary sort of Thatcherite statement you'd hear a lot then, less so now, thankfully. I don't think that would make anybody more happy. Where I do think we're failing, though, as, as I said is at the beginning, is that we have a society now which constantly seeks to evade unhappiness. There's a wonderful stoical aphorism which essentially states that the more voluntary unhappiness and pain you embrace, the less the involuntary stuff hurts. So the next time you have to get up at 5 a.m. in the morning to take your kids to football or you have to do something at work which you really don't want to, uh, just remember it's probably in the long term going to make you happy. Finally, <laughs> That's true. As long as you want to do it, that's the key thing. Uh, finally, I would say we have a, uh, a pandemic, an epidemic in this, in this country, in our, in our societies, of, of loneliness and solitude. And for me, what is the opposite of, of happiness? And I think that's a good way of understanding what real happiness is. I'd say two words, boredom and being alone. And when I say boredom, people say, oh, God, look, sometimes boredom is good. It's, you don't have to be on your phone and distract all the time. I don't mean that. I mean, bored, being bored in one's life, I think, is deeply detrimental to happiness. And I think that sense of not really having social obligations and being in touch with others again is a real, real problem. And sadly, we have a society which is built precisely on these two things, um, liberal capitalism does lots of good things. It helps us meet some of those essential needs. We've haven't, never had such extraordinary social abundance. But at the same time, uh, we're missing out on some of the, the sort of connective social tissue that actually has been the mainstay of our civilization, our societies, not just for the last 12,000 years with agriculture, for the last 200,000 years since the birth of our species. And it's only really in the last sort of 50 to 100 years that those are beginning to erode. And so that sense that actually we're more and more unhappy, uh, I don't think is inaccurate, but I don't think the problem is the pursuit of happiness. I think it's the constant evasion of unhappiness. Sometimes, if you choose to be unhappy, even briefly, it can be good for you. So, there is a bold statement. Choose unhappiness, at least in some circumstances. Thank you, Aaron, for that starting point. Paul, could I turn to you for your three-minute pitch? Yeah, most of what he just said. <laughs> oh, right, well, that's um, one in that case. <laughs> most of what he just said, not all of what he said. So, um, I distinguish between being alone and feeling lonely. Um, I think that's important. We've had an epidemic of loneliness not necessarily being alone, right? And we, we, we see loneliness rates, um, reported loneliness rates highest amongst younger people. O often people think about loneliness as being older because they are alone. Actually, y young people connected on social media often feel lonely. Um, so completely agree uh, that it's a fundamental determinant of people's happiness. Um, people make all sorts of mistakes about what's going to make them feel good keeps me in a job, really, um, sort of mocking people for their stupidity. Um, but none of us really, unless we're masochistic, well, let's leave that category to one side, actively search out things that we know for sure would make us feel worse. As I say, we make all sorts of mistakes. We get it wrong all of the time. And the reason I say that is because I have a very inclusive definition of happiness. A lot of obviously will turn on what we mean by happiness. And it was set up at the beginning as almost like a choice between happiness and purpose. The subtitle of my book, which you thankfully read out, is Finding Pleasure and Purpose in Everyday Life. Happiness, for me, includes the eudaimonic as well as the hedonic. It is a sense of feeling like what you do 
has a point, is meaningful, isn't boring. I think that's abs it's absolutely right. Boredom, boredom is awful. And without the risk of boring you by talking for too much longer, of course, the fundamental part of the human condition is survival. But it ain't survival just to any end. We're motivated to survive. We have incentives to survive if we're motivated to feel good in doing so. Um, and as I say, leaving masochism to one side, um, then we are a species that has sought to, with all sorts of mistakes and all sorts of errors, maximise happiness in one form or another. Thanks very much indeed, Paul. Succinctly put and giving us plenty to think about. And that term purpose is something we'll come back to later in the discussion, but not immediately, because I want to make sure that we have this uh, first take in terms of what we're actually talking about. Joanna Cavenna is going to lead us on on that. Thank you, Rana. Um, so I agree, yeah, dangerously quite a lot with both of my fellow. This is making me very unhappy. All this agreement. Yes, but go sorry, on. but I mean, and I. It's such an interesting word, happiness, because we all kind of agree that it's a good thing, well, apart from Aaron's arguing that it may not be in some settings. And if I wish you all a happy weekend, that's meant to be a sort of nice thing. But as Paul was saying, there's all these different meanings, of course, in, intrinsic to that. Are you a hedonist or a eudaimonist? Or, and if, I mean, it's nice, the idea that you combine them, because I always think otherwise, you know, if you said a happy weekend and then you put them to the two groups together, you know, the eudaimonists will all want to be sort of virtuous and the hedonists want to go and get smashed. And actually, they're both having a really difficult time at that point. So it's good to find a way, I think, to combine. And I was thinking about this in terms of... Uh, a, there's a good title to a, no a collection of short stories by David Foster Wallace, which is a supposedly fun thing I'll never do again. And I quite like that idea. How many supposedly fun things have we done? And maybe, in a sense, as we gain knowledge in life, part of that is gaining a sense of what these supposedly fun things are for each one of us and kind of knocking them off the list and, and learning the things that we actually enjoy. And the other thing is, as Erin was saying, I mean, this quote you mentioned, Rana, about Alexander Pope on, oh, happiness, our beings, end and aim, that's, uh, that's a kind of piece of sort of optimism philosophy from the 18th century. And Pope says, don't worry, everyone, be happy because God has got this and whatever is, is right and just kind of chill. And even within the 18th century in a very religious time, there's a huge amount of kickback to that. I mean, Voltaire says, what on earth are you talking about? You know, there's just been a terrible earthquake in Lisbon. You know, nearly 50,000 people have died and you're talking about general happiness. And he says you're making kind of general happiness you know, this sort of ultimate goal of all this dire unhappiness. I mean, how dare you? So there's a kind of debate there about how can, how can Alexander Pope be so relaxed in the face of a sort of general suffering as well? So I think I, I'm going to agree, really, that, that reality is very complex. Our lives are very <coughs> mysterious, <coughs> and I think single definition terms may not define them entirely. And, um, the philosopher William James talks about this. He actually says if you try to measure the, disc the kind of amazing continuity of experience with a single discontinuous word, then it's a bit like if you try to fish up water with a net, you're going to kind of lose all the interest and in everything that's good about life. So I guess William James would say happiness is a net <laughs> and our lives are water. And so this kind of sort of single idea will never fully encompass them. Thank you, Joe. And I love that line that happiness is a net. And if there's anyone called a net here in the audience today, <laughs> yes, in the Q&A, happy. please yes. do uh, put your hand forward and we'll find out whether that really is true or not. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.